Hello, people of God in Owasa parishes, and welcome to this week's Quick Things, another important conversation that I'll get to in a moment. <clears throat> First of all, a reminder that we are, well, maybe not a reminder because we forgot to announce it at several of our Masses this weekend, but we have an important collection on the first two weekends of October. We'll be gathering items for the baby's place. This is in conjunction with the local Knights of Columbus Council. So diapers, um, other things that babies need. The list of items is in the Quick Things email. So please check that out. Um, that's at all of our parishes this um, uh, October 1st two Sundays of October collection for the baby's place. Reminder of some other things that are kind of gearing up as we now are well into fall, I guess. Uh, remember of our reminder of our chosen watch parties, gathering to watch and talk about this wonderful series about the life and ministry of Jesus. That's at 6.30 on Wednesdays at St. Anne's, beginning this week, and at 6 p.m. Thursdays at Resurrection, beginning this week. Two Bible studies of 6.30 on Tuesdays at St. Anne and 9 a.m. Fridays at um, the office at St. Michael, so give some consideration to that. Please be thinking about who you will hopefully invite or encourage or who you might invite and encourage to our inquiry gathering about Catholicism, becoming Catholic, uh, becoming a Christian. Uh, these things, uh, people are kind of guided to it by the Spirit, but often the Spirit prompts us to help encourage them. Um, not necessarily intending to be baptized or to become a Catholic, but maybe interested in that possibility, uh, pass along an invitation and an encouragement that gathering will be at 1.30 on Sunday, October 20th in the gathering space at St. Michael. A few remaining spots in our trip at the end of October to St. John's Abbey. We've got a full lineup. It's going to be there will be lots of things that we'll have scheduled, but there will be free time as well. Um, so uh, if you're thinking about it, maybe now is the time to make the take the plunge and sign up for that. There are details in the Quick Things email. I'm sure there is there are other things that I am forgetting, but it's in the email, so please check that out. Now our conversation this uh, or this week. Uh, is a good introduction to something that begins this very day, um, Wednesday, October 1st, I believe, in Rome, um, or maybe Tuesday was October 1st, I don't know. It begins then today, Wednesday, in Rome, the Synod on Synodality, the second assembly. So the first was last fall. We gave a, a good amount of attention to that. Um, I'm talking with someone who is, was, is not a, a delegate to the Synod now, but um, participated in a separate synod gathering for pastors in the spring. So once they finished their gathering last October in Rome, they realized, wait a minute, there are no pastors in this assembly, like 350 people, no pastors. Uh, so they gathered a group of pastors and I'm gonna talk to one of those pastors in the Quick Things conversation. I'm also including in the email some helpful uh, background pieces reminding us of elements of the Synod. Uh, Father Tom Reese, a Jesuit, has a good analysis of what to expect. Bishop Bob Barron from Winona, Rochester, has his own personal reflection as he approaches the second assembly of the Synod as a participant. And then also uh, Kristen Kohlberg, who's a theology professor at St. John's University in Minnesota. Uh, she was part of the preparatory group and she kind of, in a video conversation presentation, kind of brings us up to speed on what's already happened and what we might anticipate happening in this second assembly of the Synod. So now here is this week's Quick Things Conversation. My guest today on the Quick Things Conversation is Father Bill Swift Swiftenberg, uh, pastor, priest in the Diocese of Green Bay, pastor of St. Mary Parish in Appleton. And I'm talking with him today because of an important um, experience that he had um, back in the spring regarding the Synod and Synodality, which uh, curiously begins, we're recording this a little early, but it begins on the day you are receiving this email, October Second, the Synod resumes, according to my notes, uh, the Synod resumes in Rome. And that's where Father Bill has had some influence um, in the past few months. So, Father Bill, thank you, first of all, for spending a little time with me. Tell us, first of all, a little bit about yourself, where you're from, uh, what, you know, bring us up to speed on you. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so, as Father Tom said, I'm a 
I am a priest of the Diocese of Green Bay. I have been a priest for 42 years. Of those 42 years, about 36, I've been a pastor. Um, so um, I had a, I've had a heart uh, for Pope Francis and all things Pope Francis. And um, his dream that we be a synodal church uh, will be his legacy. Uh, this is how we will remember him, that this, this is the model of what it means to be church, what it means to be a community, uh, walking together uh, side by side, uh, listening to each other learning from each other, treasuring, reverencing each other's experience because the Spirit is at work in every baptized believer. So I like the image of uh, Cleopas uh, walking with his com companion uh, after the, uh, the disappointment of the passion and resurrection of Jesus. They were going home. They were quite uh, downcast, and uh, the risen Lord walks with them. And basically listens to them, and uh, does and and really treasures uh, where they're at, and and tries to uh, encourage them. So this is kind of the icon uh, of uh, synodality. Uh, we we accompany each other. Uh, we listen with the ears of our hearts, which is sometimes uh, hard work, uh, without judging. Uh, just accepting and uh, affirming and trusting that the Spirit is at work in every baptized believer. And so bishops uh, alongside baptized believers. In terms of the synod event itself, we kind of think of it in terms of the two sessions, last October and now this October, but really the synod began uh, I think four years ago with different groups that began to plan and kind of prepare for the gatherings that have now yeah. that are that have occurred or will unfold. A, a good a friend of mine, uh, Kristen Kohlberg, who's a professor at St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota, and College of Earth, and College of St. Benedict in St. Joseph, Minnesota. She was part of that preparatory group. And so we've done a conversation with her a year ago. Um, do you know Kristen? Do you know Kristen? No, I don't. I, you she know, smiled when I said her name. So I thought, well, you must know. Well, her. if I'm from St. John's in Collegeville, so sure. that's my yeah. alma mater where I okay. went to graduate school okay. as well. Yeah. So, and you yeah. mentioned earlier that a, a few years ahead of you in class was Father Mark Pierce, who is a beloved um, yes. pastor yeah. of, of our parishes. Yeah. Um, and Kristen re recently did a conversation kind of bringing us up to speed on the whole Synod situation. And I'm sharing a link to that email or to that video in the email with this conversation as well, because she, she just has a really good, uh, as, a, as she studies ecclesiology, so she really has a good a perspective and a way to convey her understanding to other people. So the Synod, but the Synod we really kind of focused on was the session last October. And I, I guess... We prepared for that, hopefully, in our parishes. How did you do that, Bill, in your parishes? Well, um, well, so in the spring of 2022, you know, every parish was invited worldwide to um, participate in this consultative phase. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the questions were along the lines of, you know, what are your hopes and dreams for the church? What are your experiences of joy? Uh, what are your frustrations sometimes or your concerns? So we uh, gathered in uh, small groups um, and had these uh, conversations. Uh, we also did, uh, you know, that survey. Uh, and so there were 80 pages of uh, reflections from people. And I kind of processed all of that and, um, um, did a, a document uh, on um, uh, what what I heard, what I read, and so I tried to synthesize uh, the contributions of this spiritual family, a local church in Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, did you have a strong participation of your parishioners? Uh, we had, no, uh, okay. probably uh, maybe uh, 150, wow, you know, I so see. in person we had maybe 50 
to okay. 70 and then you know with the surveys so um you know i think it was a represent you know it you, it's hard to know but, i'd say that's a pretty strong participation i mean yeah so it was more than i than we had in our parishes i would say that <laughs> And we try, I mean, we made a good effort to um, have a gap, you know, have some conversation and have that gathering. But yeah, at that time, it you know, it was to get their their heads wrapped around what we're talking about. Yeah. Well, I think it has been hard for some of the bishops to get their heads wrapped up around what we're talking about as well in terms of this, this model of her church, which really isn't something new, truth be told. Right. You know, the icon of the synod would be the Council of Jerusalem, as, as recounted in the Acts of the Apostles. So, and of course, this was a dream of Vatican Council II, um, and St. Pope Paul VI really, you know, established the office of the Synod of Bishop. But it was very programmatic, uh, stiff, uh, you know, there wasn't always a lot of discussion, and it would have been bishops just sitting seated in a hall, uh, looking at the backs of each other's heads. <laughs> uh, it was very different. <clears throat> in well, the fall, the dis when they've shown the synod, that's one of the yeah. distinctions, right? Is that in the past, a synodal gathering was a bunch of clergy, usually yes. bishops, sitting facing ahead. Yeah. Whereas this synod was people sitting around a room at round tables, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So those are beautiful images. And with, uh, you know, Pope Francis himself sitting at one of the round tables for discussion. And, it, um, you know, the 350 delegates to the synod, which, who are returning now, as Father Tom said, uh, in October, uh, you know, so you had cardinals sitting among lay women. Uh, it was just a really, really beautiful image of the diversity, which is the church. You know, I read a story about <laughs> at one of the tables, one of the women was speaking and the, a cardinal, he kind of interrupted her. And another member seated at table said, uh, cardinal, she is still speaking. <laughs> you interrupted her. So, you know, it, it, but it's that kind of dialogue uh, in the spirit um, where I think there's a lot of grist for uh, and a lot of hope for a, a better church, a more engaged church. I mean, it's anecdotal, but I think there was another gathering where like in the first day, they're going around the table introducing themselves and what are we going to call each other? And one of the, they were kind of all saying their first names and one of the cardinals identified his first name. I don't remember which cardinal it was. It doesn't yeah. matter. But um, we're here kind of on equal footing around this table. Um, so in the spring, you know, one of the things they observed at the um, October session that there were very few parish priests. Um, you know, were, there any, that, were there any parish priests? I, I don't even think there were any parish yeah. priests. And so Cardinal Grack, uh, with the encouragement of Pope Francis, said that well, maybe we can have an international meeting of parish priests for the synod. And so it, that session was uh, the end of April, early May. And that's, I participated in that session. There were 200 priests. Um, and, you know, there our were days. Five, there were five from the United States. How were you one of them? I, <laughs> why were you why were you chosen and not me? I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. You would have to ask the Holy Spirit. Um, but it could have been, you know, prior to our um synodal experience in preparation for Pope Francis's uh, sessions, our parish, we had a parish synod uh to talk about our mission and vision and to get us on the same page, uh, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit. It was on the eve of Pentecost in the spring of 2021. And we had a facilitator. She uh, taught theology at Holy Family College in uh, Manitoba, uh, which uh, sadly did not survive the pandemic and closed. But uh, a wonderful, and her name is Sister Marie Colby, Zamora, and she facilitated the day. 
it was like a week after or that she found out that she was appointed to the office or the secretariat of the Senate in Rome. So since the spring of 2021, she has been in Rome and she has, I I, I met up with her when I was there uh, last uh, April. And um, so she might have had something to do with it. <laughs> okay, sure. It's, yeah, little connections. I mean, that's yeah, connections. How are these things going to happen other than drawing names out of a hat or throwing darts at them? Yeah, or something like that. So, so you have five others from the United States, a couple hundred others from around the world. You gathered in Rome. Uh, so, what was your role then in terms of this synod, a, a, an offshoot of the synod of sorts? So, um, we, I think the the model is very much like the model that they're using now uh, in October. So our morning sessions, you know, each day had a particular focus with a question for uh, dialogue. And it was the conversation in the spirit, which however you look at this, I think more than outcome, you know, people are wondering, well, what about women in the church? A possibility of deacon women uh, what about LGBTQ and how can we be more warm and welcoming as a church? All of that, you know, those are things, are genuine concerns that people have. And we need to listen to to those concerns. But, I, you know, I think some of that Pope Francis is trying to take off the table now this coming October and placing those discussions in, in small study groups that would present them, I'm thinking, uh, to the larger group this October. But anyways, outcome, I don't know. But process, I think the process is something that every parish uh, should uh, explore. And this conversation in the Holy Spirit, I think this is one of the treasures of the whole synodal experience. So we would gather, as I said, you'd have uh, your focus topic. Uh, we would have a scripture passage to reflect on. And seven minutes of silence, there's about 11 people at the table. And seven minutes of silence, and then to go around, and each person speaks for four minutes, and you listen. You just listen. You're not trying to think ahead to what your response is going to be, you just listen. And after we go around the table, if that's 10 people, that's 40 minutes uh, or, uh, or ten, yeah, 40 minutes. And then more silence. Just, you know, what did I hear? What may have struck me in a different way? Uh, what might I need be make some adjustments in my own heart, whatever. And then then you have uh, going around again for two minutes uh, to just kind of uh, reflect on what was shared. And then and then after that is you have a recorder or a secretary and we have to uh, prepare our written summary of, of that particular discussion. So this would take basically the whole morning. We'd start with morning prayer at eight. And we uh, we conclude this conversation in the spirit uh, before, right before lunch, and then we would reconvene. You know, the Italians like a little right. um, time for a nap. I needed a nap; it was pretty intense. I and would say sitting the, there listening, all that listening—it's hard work. Oh, yeah. yeah, listening with your the ears of your heart, as Saint Benedict said. Yeah. And then the general con or the general session or the plenary session they were calling it was in the afternoon, um, facilitated by five or so uh, theological experts, uh, and then um, different tables, language groups uh, were English, Spanish, Italian, and um, French, uh, and different uh, groups would present their summary statement. And then the theologians would um, process that and react and give their insights and 
that was kind of how it went. And I do think that that's basically how it happens during the whole month of October. You know, the morning is more the work session. The afternoon is this kind of reporting out. So were there any particular topics that would seem to be of interest to, you know, people in the pews or was it more theoretical? Yeah, it, you know, so it's it was really about, you know, how how are we how can we be a synodal parish? And it's it's those themes of mission, communion, and participation. And how do you empower the people of God who have a sense of the Holy Spirit, the census fidelium, co-responsibility? Uh, how is it that you that you create uh, this co-responsibility and everyone understands the mission? There's a certain communion. It's a spiritual family, the parish. Uh, how do we discern the gifts that people have and and discern the direction? You know, discernment of the spirit in the direction the spirit is moving. That's a very important piece too. Um, so it was kind of like that, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, hey. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, that that's basically. And do you uh, think yeah. so? What what impact is your gathering, or what impact will that have on this October gathering? That's the final session of this. Session. So, if you read the um, the working document now for the final session, there are a number of times where this um, international international meeting of parish priests for the synod is referred to, okay. um, and on the um, website synod.va you know our meeting are some of the notes are there i think from the theologians so you can get a, a sense the summary reports are there um in english spanish french and italian um so you can get a sense of you know one of the images that i left with is like the parish is like an orchestra and the pastor, but maybe better, the Holy Spirit is kind of the director. And, you know, each voice, each instrument has a lot to contribute. And so we treasure those gifts, those insights uh, from the entire people of God. It, it, you know, I, it's not a perfect... Uh, image but i i liked it sure well and i guess in that image you could say if the holy spirit is the conductor maybe the pastor is the first violin or whatever you know, <laughs> kind of that yeah well, right were any yeah. of the priests who participated in in the spring will they be were they invited to come to the fall i don't session? you know i'm i was trying to read the list of uh delegates for the october and it's only in italian right now okay I thought I read somewhere that one of us was, but I can't, I still have not, because the list, you know, the U.S. bishops that are there, I know our, our Archbishop Etienne, he's in Seattle, Arch, or Cardinal McElroy is in San Diego. Um, Cardinal Dolan in New York, for some reason, bowed out. I don't know what that's about, but Archbishop Laurie of Baltimore, is going in his stead. Uh, Cardinal Supich is there of Chicago. To Tobin, Cardinal Tobin in um, Newark, New Jersey is there. Uh, well, I, those are the... Yeah, the, right. And then well, there's James Martin, the Jesuit, who has done so, so much beautiful ministry in the LGBTQ community. He is there. And there's a young man He's the youngest delegate. He's in um, Wyoming. Uh, Wyatt is there. And then right. there's a, a pastoral minister in uh, Minneapolis. Right, right. Yeah. And then there's there's a young student like at Boston College or so, uh, uh, right. Julia, I think. Or, yeah. Well, it's a huge commitment in terms of time. Oh! Some of these, like Dolan, Cardinal Dolan could have bowed out just because 
Yes. He's, he's still catching up from last year, but I he has a radio show that I listen to on the on uh satellite radio and or do you? He yeah. he 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 wasn't complaining, but he talked a lot about how you have a synod of bishops when you have all these other people who aren't bishops participating. Yeah. I think there well, are I yeah. think Bishop Barron, well, Bishop Barron is part oh, of Oh, Bishop Barron is there, yeah. And he said some of those kind, made some of those comments as well that, um, you know, maybe there were just too many other people at the table. For, <laughs> no, 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 no. Them. That's the yeah, point. Of right, that. right. No, not at all. So uh, that is, you know, how do you, how do you do a more careful definition of synod of bishops when you have you know, other members of the faithful are, who are participating. You know, what, what is the, what is their role? How does that fit together? That is in a study group as well. That discussion is an important discussion. Uh, well, and that kind of gets to the heart. I, that kind of does get to some more nitty gritty aspects of what might come from this in terms of how we have consultation or councils yeah. on the local level. So, you know, we have presbyteral councils or priest councils, but we don't really have any any significant councils involving lay people. We have diocesan pastoral councils, but I don't know if it's different in Green Bay than it is here, but that doesn't really have much of a role at all at this point. Yeah, I think this is what bishops, I, and I'm not being disrespectful, but this is a, a piece you know, I think a lot of times uh, you, we have a presbyteral board at the diocesan level, and I served on that for a number of years, three. He wanted me to re-up for three more. I said, no. Um, we have, like you said, the diocesan pastoral council, which is uh, lay women and men. But what happens a lot of times, I, I think Bishop, he, this is the problem. He problem solves himself. Then he brings his proposal or solution to these advisory bodies. And then it, it seems to me back, it seems to yeah. me it would be better to bring the problem to the entire group so we can listen to each other rather than bringing a finished product. Um, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. You know, the thing <laughs> is, as you know, that takes a lot of time. Yes. You know? Yes. Um, synodality is a time consuming experience, which is not just that's that's part of the that's part of the benefit of it, too, is that it takes time to share. Yeah. And I think, and, yeah. And there's grist and sometimes yeah. there's sticking points. And I think all of that um, brings you to a, a new place. So. Right. Right. You know, I know because we I I participated in this um, Catholic initiative of nonviolence on Monday night. They do a fall series um, sponsored by Bach, Pax Christi and other groups. But um, it's um, yeah, I forget now my train of thought. Uh, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, well, like you said, it takes a lot of time. And I think, and patience. Um, and I'm thinking of, um, in the, Australia, they had quite an in-depth Senate experience. And, you know, one day the whole thing like blew up and there were groups of lay people that were wanting to walk out and I think it was about the role of women and affirming women in the church. And so they had to step back. They had to be much more um, open. It, you know, so th there was something beautiful that happened because it didn't fracture, but it was it was pretty anxiety producing. Mm -hmm. and it can get messy. It can get messy. <laughs> and messy. That's the well, word. We should probably. Yes. Probably, so, but I just want to. So in her presentation, Kristen Kohlberg, who I mentioned earlier, she identified yes. five things that she thinks will be uh, things to listen for in this upcoming session. I'll just I'll throw them out and then see what you think. Renewing the councils in the church, pastoral councils, diocesan, deanery councils, that they that they're mandatory. <laughs> And there are three genuine consultations, so that not just be perfunctory. 
uh, that, that they will address the ministry information of priests and maybe even bishops, how that occurs, how we call forth candidates for the priesthood. Um, reforming of canon law, she says, from the center, she said we shouldn't see canon law as an annoyance, but something that is a benefit to the church. The role of bishops conferences, which I think gets to uh, liturgical translations and lots of other things as well. Yeah. And, then the, and she said, well, it's never going to be on an official agenda. She said the role of women in the church will almost certainly be lurking in the shadows. She called it the pink elephant. And when the pink elephant is in the room and you're told, don't look at the pink elephant, all you look at is the pink elephant. Yeah. So any, any reactions to her? Yeah, I think she's idea? spot on. I think some of those conversations were um, delegated to those study groups. I know, you know, the role of bishop in terms of synodality, um, our consultative bodies in the parish. We talked about that as parish priests for the synod. I think she is right. You know, when I think of Vatican Council II beginning in 1962, you know, these people, they all came in with the documents like all ready to go. All yeah. we would do is we'd uh, approve them. Well, that whole thing didn't go, you know, and they threw everything out and started from, you know, the perspective of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to, this is going to come out of this council, these documents. Uh, I do think, you know, the role of women, I do think uh, I'd add, you know, the, across the world, except maybe not so much in Africa, but the LGBTQ is huge. It is huge for the church. In America, you know, James Martin, the Jesuit priest is doing so much beautiful ministry. The website outreach.com, uh, he just did a piece. I didn't get a chance to read it about, you know, James Martin. He was there and, and there were a lot of people pushing against him and he purposely took this whole year to reach out to some of those people, this is my under, and have a conversation with them and to understand their perspective uh, and then to create a kind of a response. So, yeah. Yeah. I uh, think that's there too, though. Yeah. Great. Right. So maybe another pink elephant or yes. something like well, that. Anyway, things that we'll, 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 we'll see where this, like you said, at the Second Vatican Council, the folks in the Curia thought they knew exactly how this was going to play out, what this was going to bring forth. And, well, the Spirit, the Spirit, they prayed to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit heard the prayer um, and react, responded accordingly. Yeah, that's great. That's I amazing. love that. You know, the Holy Spirit is always doing something new, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, whether we're certain. willing to go along with it or not. You know? Oh, yeah, I know. So, Father Bill Swichtenberg, thank you very much for talking with me. Thank you for your commitment to this synodal process because that takes a lot of a lot of effort um, and it is hard work. And thank yes. you for your participation among the, the pastors who gathered um, last spring in Rome because that was a challenging experience as well, I'm sure, but also gratifying in so many ways. Um, I want to conclude with an a, a excerpt from The Joy of the Gospel, Pope Francis's encyclical, uh, which really, I think, sets the stage for the entire synodal process um, in, many, in, in terms of some of the th observations he made in that encyclical. I just want to leave us with this. So Pope Francis will have the last word. When we live out a spirituality of drawing near to others and seeking their welfare, our hearts are opened wide to the Lord's greatest and most beautiful gifts. Whenever we encounter another person in love, we learn something new about God. Whenever our eyes are opened to acknowledge the other, we grow in the light of faith and knowledge of God. Amen.